right, the next question is also yours, and it is true or false. Paul onlyism is a serious problem. And I don't know if you want to uh, add it into that, Luke. <laughs> okay. That. All right. Uh, I think everybody's heard me mention this enough over the years. If you've, if you've known me very long, uh, you probably know what I'm referring to. But for those people who are either new or haven't paid attention, when I say Paul onlyism, I'm talking about a, an aspect of what's called hyper-dispensationalism. Now, I, I, I'm not really a dispensationalist uh, uh, to any degree, really, uh, but um, I was uh, a dispensationalist for probably 25 years. Uh, but so I'm not, I'm not speaking about, dis, about dispensationalists um, broadly, but uh, I'm talking about a, 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 let's call it a spectrum of dispensationalism where, you know, there's a range and, and, and people go too far in dispensationalism when they say, for example, that Paul, the apostle Paul, he, the only, he's the only one that we should be listening to as Christians because he's the apostle to the Gentiles. And uh, he's the one that gave us the gospel in first Corinthians 15, one through four. Uh, so there are people who are hyper dispensationalists where they say, uh, you can't get saved by reading uh, the Gospel of John, even though the Gospel of John, it actually says the reason the book was written to, was to tell us how to get saved. Uh, but uh, and, and so they say that you can only be saved by reading the, the, the writings of the Apostle Paul. And then there's another end of the spectrum where they go even further. And some of these are what's called ultra dispensationalists, where they say not only is Paul the only one you can get salvation from, but you can only get saved and only Paul was saved during the prison, prison epistles. So you can see how far that they, they can take this. Uh, that's what Paul only is and is. Paul's the only one uh, that we should be listening to as, as Christians. Uh, the, the rest of it is really directed only to, the, to Jews and to Israel. So that now I remember how I stated the question, but that's what Paul onlyism is. Uh, ben, how is the question stated again? Paul onlyism is a serious problem. Oh, okay. All right. So now I, you know what it is. So, uh, who wants to go first on this? I guess I will. Um, uh, first of all, I I, I want to I, I want to fall back on the last question. There was one comment that someone was wrote it in Italian. <laughs> I had to put it into a translator. So this is the best translation I got from what they what they wrote. Uh, the the English was absolutely not. Moreover, I have been excommunicated by the Universalist and the Ecumenical Churches. Um, so I wouldn't. Uh, that's a badge of honor, probably. But um, so that was that was from the last question with regards to Paul onlyism. Is it a serious problem? Yes, I believe it's a serious problem. I mean, I don't think it's a salv salvific problem. I don't think it's, you know, I think you can uh, you can believe. I, I don't know how you believe. I, I haven't put, committed to much thought. Uh, Luke, you're certainly the expert in this. I haven't committed enough thought uh, about it specifically, as you have. But, um, I mean, again, if you list a Paul only, well, then you can, uh, uh, you can certainly get saved from everything Paul says. But Paul doesn't conflict. Uh Paul doesn't contradict Jesus. He doesn't contradict John. He doesn't contradict any of the other apostles. So I don't know where people come up with this garbage, frankly. Um, to, because again, P even Peter would say, uh, yeah, I think he says in, it's it's Second Peter. He says, you know, uh, these are things that I'm paraphrasing. Uh, that you know, th these things are the same things that uh, our brother Paul has written about, which some men have. Um, that that uh, that men very, which such men they're talking about unsafe false teachers in this context, but that, that these men these unsafe false teachers twist the scriptures like they do all scripture. And when he when he's referring to scripture, he's specifically referring to Paul's epistles, uh, calling it scripture, um, saying that uh, they twist the scripture to their own destruction. Uh, and I think essentially that's what these Paul onlyists do. Now I'm not saying their own destruction in terms of eternal damnation. I'm just saying they do it to their own. Uh, um, their own, their, their own, uh, uh, 
uh, penalty, or I don't know what the word I'm looking for. But anyways, uh, again, they 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 do that. They 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 exclude a ton of scripture that's very instructional, um, and so I don't know where they come up with this, with this stuff. Um, and, and again, to say that you can't get uh, saved um, uh, from John's gospel, I mean, th that's just astounding. The incomp that. It's a, it's a st the incompetence with handling scriptures is just astounding. It's it's really staggering that people could make such a, a ridiculous claim. Frankly, um, again, I'm not holding back. I'm just giving you my opinion, because uh, again, I I don't know where people come up with that stuff. In fact, I almost went to a church locally. I actually thought I found oh, I have a local church. Not actually it wasn't even that local. It's still probably a couple hours drive, but it was something uh, when I was looking for a church. This is about uh, five to ten years ago. I, I, ran, I did come across a church that had the true gospel, but then I come I did find out that they were Paul onlyists, uh, and that really turned me off. And I said, no, I don't want anything to do with them, uh, even though they do have the right gospel. Uh, you know, again, they they would refute that you could get saved from John's gospel. They would refute that uh, Jesus statement. Uh, you know, uh, gospel um, invitations and in, even in the other synoptics are. Uh, null and void for Gentiles, or null and void for this day and age. So yeah, I I think it's a, a uh, I I personally am a, a dispensationalist, and then my again my my idea of dispensation is that God reveals a, a different has different has revealed different amounts of information about His plan to man over time. That's really the extent of my dispensationalism, and um. But this is a form of hyper dispensationalism, where they basically see teach that there's different ways of getting self, uh, different ways of getting saved. Like in the Old Testament, it was law plus works, or in the tribulation, it's it's essentially law plus works because you must believe and not take the mark, or you must believe and not um, uh, worship the beast or whatever, or you must uh, you must uh, believe in the in the tribulation, you must believe and and persevere in the faith. Again, I think those are all heretical doctrines. And uh, I don't believe the Bible teaches that at all. And it's always been say uh, grace through faith, grace uh, through faith in, in 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 God. And it, it the content I, I would argue the content has changed. The content of the message that you, you have to believe has changed slightly. Uh, it's gotten slightly more specific, but but the means, the grounds of salvation, has always been the same: grace through faith. Okay, Amen. Uh, I wanted to just say be before someone else answers that uh, your uh, definition uh, on dispensationalism uh, is one that I agree with. I know we talked about this a lot the last few years, and uh, Renee would define it the same way. This is the kind of dispensationalism that we would say is acceptable, that God has been dispensing more and more revelations about his plan throughout history and we understand a little bit more a little bit more until now we've got a full picture of it uh that so it's been dis gradually dispensed uh the details uh but that's really not the definition that a dispensationalist would use to define dispensationalism but it's it's, it's also there's a a wide spectrum of dispensationalism too there, there's varying degrees of it uh but I, I agree with what you said that uh, there's a, uh, they're not, they are saved. If dispensa I mean, the hyper dispensationalists, Paul only is, they're, they're saved. Uh, they're, I, I've been had real close relationships with them when I first came on YouTube. Um, there's the ones that were, had a problem with me because I was preaching out of the Gospel of John. They kept on reprimanding me for quoting the Gospel of John. Um, so they're, but they're saved. That's not the issue. The, I have other issues with them that I'll, I'll get to when it's my turn. But uh, let's go to uh, uh, Sister Angel next. All right. Sorry. You're, yeah. <laughs> I had to, I have to run out to the gas station to hopefully that they have mayonnaise because Joel got home so late. So, um, and he forgot to get mayo, and I'm making chicken salad. And I was in the middle of making it, and we don't have any mayo. So um, I'm just warning you guys ahead of time. I'm going to have to start the truck while I'm answering, but unless you want to go to somebody else. But because um, I, I have uh, – this question is uh, interesting to me in the sense that I don't really know what defines, like, serious. Because I guess when I think of a serious problem, I think of a, a problem that would intervene in salvation, Right. So um, on the one, it's so hard to answer it for that, that one word because it is a problem. 
Um, absolutely. Uh, because uh, just think of all the scripture we're throwing out uh, to, to Gentiles um, that, uh, that I've not ever actually encountered a Paul onlyist. So that's the other reason why I've, why I have a hard time answering the question because uh, at least for me uh, so far, it's been so obscure and I encounter so many people that have the exact opposite problem, which is that they, they throw out Paul completely. They call him a false apostle because they're Judaizing. And so uh, I guess I'll, I'll have to, to answer undecided. And I, want, I can't wait to hear what Luke has to say about this because um, you, you've studied it so much more. Uh, and I think you've dealt with it more. Um, I understand the precepts of Paul only as, Paul onlyism. I, I could almost understand if somebody was using it like as um, not so much a, a black and white, you know, yes or no, you know, like like dogmatic uh, teaching, but rather like a, a guideline. If they were just really worried about people, um, really worried about people getting the wrong message and, and wanting them to stick to Paul in order to understand uh, salvation, I can, I can understand it. I don't think it's necessary. I think it, it undercuts the role of the Holy Spirit. It underestimates the, 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 the role of the Holy Spirit um, and, um, and the fact that all of God's word is, um, you know, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm freezing in this truck. I'm trying to think of the, the verse. Um, well, it's, it's, it's profitable for doctrine. Um, and um, that's not just Paul. And I think it almost elevates Paul above Jesus, which is uh, problematic. But from a, I guess, from a utilitarian standpoint, um, it's hard to come down on it too hard because I'm constantly dealing with the, the, the extreme opposite of the spectrum. And even people that recognize Paul as a, as a true apostle, just being completely blind to his words or disregarding his words um, and, and, um, and doubling back to anything they can find that contradicts, basically what they're saying is it contradicts what Paul's saying, although they're upholding him as a true apostle, they're, they're not trying to find the point of um, congruence between um, some of the other uh, books and the, you know, the other verses that so many, especially Lordshippers, love to point out, um, uh, you know, especially from the book of James, um, that, uh, and they don't want to see where, where the, uh, like, there's only one viewpoint that can be correct right works or works or grace paul clearly teaches grace and whereas people that actually understand grace have a, have an explanation that reconciles all all of these verses um i notice a lot of people that want to disregard paul or pay lip service to paul in his verses what they really do is they 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 take interpretations that completely nullify what paul says so they would almost be rejecting Paul whether they want to admit it or not because he's you know there's no way to you know interpret some of the stuff he's saying uh in any other way besides you know uh, basically uh, the gospel that we preach grace through faith alone and eternal security so um I, I'm gonna say undecided just because um I guess I I guess I'm I'm so uh, frustrated on a daily basis by people that that take the opposite position of Paul only as some, or uh, are just constantly in conflict with Paul one way or the other that, you know, if I had to choose a false doctrine that people would believe, I guess I would choose Paul only because it gets, it gets the job done. Right. You know what I mean? So <laughs> um, I understand. But, uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm trying to pick my battles here, but um, you know, Beyond salvation, it, there there's so many places that there's so many pitfalls to Paul only Paul onlyism and and just the growth is your growth as a believer that I, I definitely understand how those things are serious but um in you know comparison to everything else we're dealing with I just uh you know I I can't get too uh too flustered about it because uh I, you know at, at least at least they'll understand the gospel if they go that way you know at least they'll understand it. Um, gospel, you know, that's what Paul was for. I believe he was, he was there to make it uh, just, um, inex inescapably clear to everybody. And that's why all people can do is disregard him and demote him and, and claim he's a false apostle, which also, you know, calls God a liar 
you know, uh, in the process, uh, because, you know, and that he didn't preserve his word and that he let some false apostle, you know, infiltrate into scripture uh, in so many places, because we know that Paul wrote, you know, well, at least many believe he wrote, you know, more books of the Bible than anybody else. So, but, um, but I'll, I'll leave it there because I do really want to, want to hear what Luke has to say as somebody who's uh, looked into this so much. All right. Thank you. you. You made a lot of very good and valid points. Uh, so I, I will answer when it's my turn, but uh, let me see whose turn, who wants to go next? I can go. Um, so I, I don't know what Paul onlyism is. Um, I have based on the name and based on what I've heard. Um, I think I've come up with an answer to this. And my answer comes from Paul himself. It says, now I say this, and, and this is in first Corinthians chapter one, verse 12. Now I say this to each of you who says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? My opinion on Paul onlyism, or, or pretty much anything else that divides the body of Christ is this. If you both believe if there are two people who both believe that Jesus died for their sins, they both believe that he was raised from the dead three days later. They both believe that they are saved by grace through faith based on the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. I don't care what book of the Bible you're reading. I don't care what ism or, or ist or anything else you believe that you are. If we can agree on the truth of the gospel and we're not trying to take away from it or add to it, then this really, really frustrates me because Jesus is coming back for a bride. And he's coming back for the whole bride, not just the head, not just the arm, not just the foot. And I'm sorry, I am I am getting upset because this is this is a subject that is very near and dear to my heart. If we cannot unite as the body of Christ and as his bride, then what is he coming back for? We need to come together as the body of Christ and stop fighting with one another. Stop having these, these words divide us. I, it, it really is my pet peeve. Paul was very clear. He did not have people baptized in his name. In fact, he said that he doesn't think he baptized anyone and then remembered two or three people that he did baptize. If, which is another reason that um, I, I don't believe in, in that you have to be baptized to be saved. Obviously it's in the Bible that you don't have to be baptized to be saved. But if, if we were supposed to baptize people to get them saved, Paul would have done it. Jesus would have done it. And all of the apostles would have been doing it. And that would have been the main topic of their ministry, but it wasn't the main topic of their ministry was Christ and Christ crucified. And as long as we can agree on that, then I think we need to get past all of these isms and ists and all of that. Isms cause schisms. That was a that was an awesome answer, Heather. Awesome. There you go. Hmm. How did I miss that? Did Heather say isms cause schisms? No, I just invented that. I just I'm pretty pretty pleased with that. Yeah, that's <laughs> a good one. That's good. Maybe we should add that to the truisms that we we publish. You know. All right. Okay, uh, let me see who hasn't spoken on this yet. Uh, uh, Lisa? Oh. All right, ben, All right. I'm here. I'm here. It just took me a second to get to the button. Um, okay. Ben, just for clarification, can you restate the question for me? Yes. Paul onlyism, as like as in Apostle Paul, Paul onlyism is a serious problem. Yeah, I think so. I think it's error. Um, 
<clears throat> the Bible says that all scripture is given uh, for what instruction and righteousness for reproof. Uh, we're supposed to uh, look at the whole Bible and then glean from it the things that we need for whatever's going on in our lives, whatever situation, whether or not we're teaching or preaching. Uh, it's all given by inspiration of God. And so there's there's a problem with any onlyism anywhere. And every time we see that, it does create issues and it does create problems. I wanted to read, uh, you know, because there's just like, there's like right now there's this thing going on with where the new covenant is not for, I, I'll never understand this in a million years, but the new covenant is not for um, believers today. It's only for Israel, which is a bunch of bunk. Uh, Jesus is the new covenant. And I stand with everyone that agrees with me on that. If you don't have the new covenant, you don't have a covenant. Uh, let's see. Now, if we go over, this is one I always like to point to, but I, I think I'll start, start with, um, Timothy, which is an epistle of uh, Paul here. Let's see. I hope I didn't lose my place. I think I did. So I clicked on it. But anyway, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, let me start at verse 3. Hmm. I'll just start at verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, Repu reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables but thou in all things endure afflictions and do the work of an evangelist make full proof of thy ministry now the work of an evangelist i think we can all keep it real simple is to preach the gospel of the lord jesus christ that men might be saved and we know in the gospel in first corinthians 15 1 through 4 is how that jesus christ died for our sins was crucified buried and resurrected on the third day as the payment full and complete payment and pardon for all men's sins who will believe. If they will believe on him and receive the gift of pardon, they will be saved. Doesn't matter their ethnicity, doesn't matter where they came from, doesn't matter what they've done, because none of that's included. It doesn't say accept, accept, accept. It says if you do that, you're saved. And then let's see, when I drop down here, doggone it, I don't want to lose my place. Uh, it's another passage here that's very important. Okay, verse 17. Uh, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lions. He's talking about a specific instance, something happened, but he is telling you that he was charged to preach that all the Gentiles. Might hear, might hear what about the new covenant? Okay, now I want to go over here because there's another doctrine that's tied into this that's connected. People teach this mess all the time, and it's false, which is that the old covenant saints had a different uh, 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 way of being saved through the law keeping, right? Now, the law was given as a foreshadow of the promise of Jeremiah 31, and it was uh, what we see. Is revealed here in Hebrews uh, 9, 10, and 11. I always tell you guys, go read that. It repudiates all this law-keeping stuff, uh, both for believers today and shows you that the old covenant saints couldn't do it. And that was to prove to them that they couldn't do it. And uh, to the world that it can't be done, that only one person could keep it. And the Bible tells us that, and that person was the Lord Jesus Christ. And we go to chapter 11, verse 24. By faith. Moses. Now, who was who was Moses? The lawgiver. OK, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of who? The reproach of Christ. Now, wait a minute. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. According to these people, 
None of the old covenant saints were looking forward to the promised Messiah. And I keep pointing this out. This right here in your Bible that they absolutely were. OK, esteeming the reproach of Christ. Greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. This was revealed to the old covenant saints and they believed on the promised messiah another example i'll give you is i can never remember that gentleman's name that was waiting at the temple door when jesus was being brought in by his earthly father his stepfather which was joseph and his mother to be circumcised he was a prophet he was waiting he had been told you ain't gonna die till you see the messiah now if he wasn't looking for the promised Messiah, how could he be standing there waiting to look at him? See, this is the biggest nonsense I've ever heard in my life. The old covenant saints believed on the promise. The promise was given right there at the fall when Adam the male and Adam the female fell. And the Lord said the prophecy about the coming Messiah was going to bruise or crush the serpent's head. And that he would bruise his heel. They knew the Messiah was coming. And believers have always believed on the Messiah. And I believe that when she announced, when she first had her, her firstborn child, she said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. She was rejoicing. She actually thought that was the Messiah. Can't prove it. Just believe it. I believe that because she was happy about it. Why was she happy? Because she thought that was the one. They didn't know it was going to take thousands of years for Jesus to come. You look at Isaiah when he write, how did he see what looks like he was seated at the foot of the cross? This is a bunch of nonsense. And the only people who fall for it, I'm sorry, I ain't trying to offend anybody, is people who don't know their Bible or they're looking at it from a very simplistic and legalistic position. This is all about Jesus. We go from Genesis to the book of the revelation of who? Jesus Christ is all about him from the beginning to the end. And anybody who would speak against that either doesn't know their Bible and is doing so in error and ignorance, or they are against the Lord. There, there's really only two ways you can slice it. But that's all I got to say. on. It. OK, that was quite a bit. Thank you, sister. Let me see. Uh, ben, you haven't uh, given an answer yet, have you? Yes, I have. You have. OK, everybody answered. Oh, right. Um, well, first of all, um, Angel, you, you made some very valid points, and I think that's one of the reasons that you and, and um, uh, many people would uh, find it acceptable or at least tolerable uh, to uh, have um, the Paul only us. By the way, as far as I know, I invented the term Paul onlyism or Paul onlyist. I don't, maybe other people use it and I'm not aware of it. It's normally always historically been called hyper dispensationalism. Hyper just means that if you, the word prefix hyper in front of a word means you've taken whatever it is to an extreme, uh, too far. You've gone too far with it. So uh, they've taken uh, what, most would say dispensationalism, even if we're not a dispensational in, in, dispensationalist in the classical sense, uh, um, we don't say, hey, if you're a dispensationalist, I, you're, you're not a Christian. We don't, we don't say that at all. But when you take dispensationalism to, that, to such an extreme, it becomes very problematic in a lot, a lot of ways. I'll, I'll give you some examples here. Um, now, by the way, what I'm going to tell you right now is this much, okay? about this subject. I've got a playlist and it would be this much if you watch the playlist as far as explaining all the, the problems with this. So I, I, my answer to the question is absolutely yes. It is a serious problem. Now, even though if uh, someone is a Paul onlyist, uh, they, they believe the gospel, they're just as much as saved as you and me. Okay. So what's the harm in it then? Okay. Well, let's look at... Uh, um, what is, what's the, the official definition of it? Here's, here's what, if you look it up in encyclopedias or something, it says, it says the grace movement 
uh, it's called grace movement. By the way, if you're not familiar with it, the, the, all you got to do is just listen for these key words. Uh, the grace movement, they've hijacked that. They've hijacked the term um, rightly divide. They, if, if someone is always talking about rightly divide, now I know we have some here that in our congregation that use the term rightly divide, and it is a biblical term. It's valid. It's true. I believe in rightly dividing. I rather than dividing to me the only division that is proper is the cross you have people looking forward to the cross and you have us looking backward to the cross when we divide it up into all these other dispensations and stuff we're we're over dividing the word of god and then the hyper dispensationists take take that even further so they divide it and separate everything else except for paul's letters and then some others they say not even paul all of paul's letters only the prison epistles which are there's only four epistles so um, here's, uh, here's what, uh, if you look it up, you'll get an official, says the, the grace movement or hyper dispensationalist, mid acts dispensationalism, ultra dispensationalism, or more rarely called Bullingerism, um, uh, to which ultra dispensationalism uh, properly applies, is a Protestant doctrine that basically views the teachings of the apostle Paul, both as unique from earlier apostles and as foundational for the church. Now, foundational for the church will agree, but not unique. Uh, I have made numerous videos showing that the, 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 the sermons by Peter are the same sermons as, uh, as Paul, and the sermons by Jesus is the same. I've compared the teachings of the, of the gospel of, of Peter, Jesus, John, P Paul. It's the same gospel, but they argue that now only Paul has the gospel. And uh, they even say that you can't get saved by the red letters. Now, that's an opposite extreme. There's another faction of people that go to the other end and say, you can only be saved by the red letters, which are the actual words that spoken by Jesus. So that you can, it's just an example of going to an extreme the other direction. Uh, but the, uh, the Paul Onius will say, no, you can't even be saved by listening to, to, to Jesus. Um, so a hyper dispensation of exists in, in, in different intensities. E.W. Bullinger, he lived from 1837 to 1913. He was an Anglican clergyman and scholar, best known uh, as early expositor of Acts 28, ultra dispensationalism. So what they do is they, I don't know about you guys, I assume everybody here agrees that the church began at Pentecost. That would be Acts chapter two. That's when Pentecost happened. But the, the hyper-dispensationalist says, no, the church began either in mid-Acts, that's at Paul's conversion, that's when the church began, according to them. There were no believers, no Christians, until Paul's conversion. Then the ultra-dispensationalists, they go even further, and they say it's Acts chapter 28. That's when the church began. Uh, the church did not begin until Paul's imprisonment in Rome when God revealed it as a mystery this so-called mystery is said to be exclusively revealed in the prison epistles, uh, Philippians, uh, uh, Philemon, uh, Ephesians, and Colossians that Paul wrote while in prison. Um, so that's that's like the official definitions and, and, and uh, explanation of what it is. But here's what Ironside said. I don't know if you're familiar with him, H.A. Ironside. He's a, a, a Christian scholar from... He lived from 1876 to 1951, and he hated hyperdispensationalism. This is what he said. Having had most intimate acquaintance with Bollingerism, but Bollinger is the one that's credited with the beginning of, of this, uh, so that's why it's called Bollingerism. Uh, having an intimate acquaintance with Bollingerism is taught by many for the last 40 years. I have no hesitancy in saying that its fruits are evil, it has produced a tremendous crop of heresies throughout the length and breadth of this and other lands. It has divided Christians and wrecked churches and assemblies without number. It has lifted up its votaries in intellectual and spiritual pride to an appalling extent so that they look with supreme contempt upon Christians who do not accept their peculiar views. And there's more, but that's the... the uh, that's what uh, Ironstein said about it. He obviously he considered it a serious problem. I'll tell you, we we had a uh, uh, a group of people that were with CES that, and there was a need for a separation, 
And uh, part of the reason for that is because uh, the, they were causing division, um, criticizing and challenging, questioning everybody else's salvation. And that's what the hyperdispensationalist also does. They, they're they against, uh, they refuse to participate in communion or water baptism. And they'll say that if you are if you're, uh, doing communion or water baptism, you're not really a Christian. You're not really saved because they interpret that as adding a work. Uh, regardless of if you say, I'm not, I'm not getting baptized as a work, I'm getting baptized as a, out of obedience because God, the Bible says we're supposed to get water baptized after we get saved. Uh, uh, so, um, but they, they refuse it and forbid it. Um, but they also elevate the Apostle Paul uh, to such an extent, not only above all the apostles, but they elevate him even above Jesus. As I said, you can't get let received from the, the words of Jesus, only from the words of Paul. Um, so I guess uh, those are the main things. But um, you, you can identify them as they, they, they will always use the term rightly dividers. Uh, they're... Um, uh, Romans through Philemon is what they'll always say. Romans through Philemon, only those books. Um, um, the Berean Bible Institute is one of the main champions of this. And uh, one of the, there's quite a few teachers on uh, that are prominent on YouTube. Les Feldick, if you ever run across him, he's one of the prominent uh, teachers. Now, uh, when I first came on YouTube, I probably had about 10 or 15 of them as some of my closest friends and allies in the beginning uh, because I did like angel. I thought, well, they believe the gospel. They're saved. They're preaching faith alone, no works. So we work together. But the more I, I, I learned about it, I realized that the, what the problem was they're challenging. Every, I had one girl contact me in, in, in tears, completely crushed, and her faith, you know, her, her uh, confidence and her salvation uh, shattered. Because they said, because she dared to get water baptized, she wasn't really saved. So these are the kinds of problems that uh, that we have with this. Uh, okay, Angel, does that help? Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Wow. Yeah, see, that's what I needed to know was how far they take it. I mean, that sounds like they don't even really believe in internal security if they, they feel like revoke your salvation because you got water baptized or or what that um no, I mean, that sounds that, like it's, it's like a workspace so, thing it's not that the water baptism uh or caused the girl to lose her salvation it just that proved she wasn't that saved she proved that she didn't have faith entirely in jesus because she got water baptized wow so it sounds like it sounds like you have to have faith in paul only only in, oh paul onlyism to be saved according to them not that you know you can only get saved through paul's writings but that you have to actually agree with all of the things that they espouse and that and eschew all the other things i didn't i didn't realize that because um you you know she could have uh just been unclear about paul being the only one that you need to listen to but still believe what he said um this now, Andrew, you have not you have not had really much if or any interactions no. with them. If you do, you will learn very quickly that they're completely intolerant of our position. That you can get saved by listening to Jesus or the Gospel of John, or, uh, or and they will definitely every single time you dare to to quote anything apart from Paul and and and. Uh, the, the gospel in First Corinthians, uh, then uh, you will be immediately uh, chastised, and uh, and your for... salvation question. Yeah. yeah, yeah. See that that's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem. That that's a, that is a serious problem because that really kind of it all it all sort of seems to circle back around to the gospel one way or another, doesn't it? Because mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, understanding that the way that you like, you know, I I thought it was basically that they said that the way like basically like how people have the argument over like Romans Road or like methods of evangelism but they're actually taking it so far as to say that even if someone you know maybe has the correct understanding now or has come to agree with them but uh, they you know didn't uh, see it that way upon believing that you know maybe they weren't saved in the first place kind of like the people that we originally separated from yeah, it's it reminds the same, me very much of that. 
Yes, it's the same spirit of arrogance and pride and uh, and specialized understanding. Uh, like, you know, oh, well, yes. you don't have this. Uh, obviously, you have this uh, discernment that, so you must not have the Holy Spirit or whatever. And also, too, but what's, what's hilarious, I mean, it's not funny, not funny, is um, my experience, at least, Paul, or uh, Luke, is that they also believe that in the tribulation that it's faith plus works, which is, you know, that's my experience. They they they, they are hyper dispensationalists. There are different uh, means of salvation at different times. I don't know if that's your your experience or not. Yeah, well, that that is the case with hyper dispensationalism. But there are people who I would not call Paul Onius, who are also uh, they have a version of dispensationalism where they also believe that uh, apart from the Church Age, before and after, it's faith plus works. That's 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 not unusual in dispensationalism. How, however, not everybody who says they're dispensationalists agrees with that. Many dispensationalists that we know, they they denounce that and say, no, it's always been grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. Which is ridiculous because if if that's true, if they say that's true, then they're actually saying that you have to believe some kind of certain incantation of Paul's words to actually be saved. You couldn't just hear a generic gospel presentation. I, that that's what that's the logical conclusion to me. Um, would you agree yeah, with that I or agree. no? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, they they take the two verses, First uh, Corinthians fifteen verses three and four, as the only means. If you were to explain the gospel uh, any other uh, uh, any apart from that, even if even if you include that, it, it, it's uh, uh, that. I mean, I do agree that. Uh, as we, when we made our gospel message in one sentence, obviously we included the death, burial, and resurrection of, of, of Jesus. But uh, uh, they, they would say that uh, uh, you can't get that anywhere else except in that one place in the Bible. Okay. See, this, what bothers me about that is that it reminds me too much of the way I was raised. I was raised a Jehovah's Witness. And the Jehovah's Witnesses very strongly say that the only way to get saved is to believe what they believe, to follow what they say, and to not study it out on your own, but to take the word of the governing body as proof and, and the final say on what the Bible is trying to say to you. Um, and I adamantly disagree with anything like that. 